Thank you, Professor Moore and uh, Colloquium organizers. It's great to be here in Zurich. I wanted to uh, start off by uh, giving a tale of a confused comet, which I'm going to re return to. This is Comet Oterma. We're going to be looking at it in an inertial frame, so seen from above the solar system. We've got a Jupiter uh, orbiting around the sun, which is in, in the center. The comet is the, the red thing that's leaving a trail. So Oterma was interesting in that it had an encounter with Jupiter, which put it now on the inside of Jupiter's orbit. It has another encounter with Jupiter, which takes it back outside. And this happened completely naturally. This is from uh, 1910 to 1980. In fact, the only way that Oterma was uh, observed was during this phase when it was inside Jupiter's orbit. Otherwise, it would be unobservable. And it was uh, surprising when this was first uh, discovered that a comet did this interesting jump from inside to outside. The way we can understand it better is to now move into a frame which is moving with Jupiter in, in its orbit. So now it's Sun and uh, Jupiter are fixed along the x-axis and I'll show the same movie again and now in this rotating frame. So you'll see the comet, it starts on the outside, passes through a little narrow corridor around Jupiter and now moves around inside of uh, Jupiter's orbit and then back out. Those green trajectories are some special trajectories, they're special orbits in the restricted three-body problem, homoclinic and heteroclinic orbits uh, associated with unstable periodic orbits, which will play a, a big role in what I'm going to talk about. But just the idea here of uh, motion from inside to outside, it looks chaotic, but now when we look in this rotating frame, we're able to reveal some structure that, that wasn't as obvious before. And uh, this is something real, physical. It's an interesting way to go from one orbit to an another. So why not use it for designing spacecraft trajectories? So this is a, a, a spacecraft trajectory that goes from uh, an initial orbit, which is outside the orbit of Jupiter, so we're looking in the Jupiter system, and three of the icy moons of Jupiter, Callisto, Ganymede, and Europa. If we start out with an initial orbit, which just grazes the orbit of Callisto, we can find a zero, a zero fuel spacecraft tour. So this is a completely natural trajectory, it doesn't use any fuel, and it can uh, orbit or at least encircle several of the moons. This is the close approach of Ganymede. And let's say our, our ultimate goal is to get to Europa. Here's the sort of, sort of a corkscrew looking approach to Europa, where now using a little bit of fuel, you can get the spacecraft onto a inclined orbit about Europa. So we could do some observations, look for um, uh, an ocean un underneath the ice. So we take our inspiration from comets, but apply it to uh, spacecraft trajectories, and we can come up with very uh, interesting paths. Uh, this is a, an artist's rendering of this idea of natural paths ex existing throughout the solar system. So this is the idea of an interplanetary superhighway, or an in interplanetary transport network. Um, we don't need to build a superhighway. It's not as if there are tubes that need to be built out of concrete out in space. These are just natural freefall paths but not like we're used to, not in the, the Keplerian orbit. It's a, these, are, these are trajectories in the, the three-body problem, not the two-body problem. And the I idea applies to uh, other systems as well. So for example, uh, you saw some tube structures on the, pr the previous slide. We can get filamentary structures um, in, in galactic dynamics that may be related to these, these tube structures we see in the few-body problem. Let me go over some important ideas Let's just talk about the, the restricted few body problem. We're going to look at chaotic transport of small bodies under Hamiltonian flow. The flow might be due to point masses or a more general gravity potential. We're looking at very low dimensional dynamics, so a low dimensional phase space, which to me is 4D or 6D. To understand the transport, we're going to look for phase space structures that, that mediate transport in, in the phase space. So these will go by exotic names like tube dynamics lobe dynamics. And in some cases we might want to use approximate statistical models uh, that are common in, in chemistry, which basically amounts to determining the ratio of, of phase space volumes. And this gives us things that are, at least in chemistry, are um, the, the uh, reaction rate. But when we apply it to celestial mechanics, this gives us rates of escape and capture about 
um, celestial bodies. So here, some, uh, here's an outline of what we're going to do. I'm going to ask some questions about solar system populations and give you a crash course in tube dynamics, which I think helps understand uh, some of these questions and provide some answers. So basically, we're going to squeeze these low dimensional phase spaces uh, for all they're worth, get all the information we can out of them. So what are some of those questions? We want to be able to characterize uh, motion of things like Jupiter family comets, of which Oterma is an example, but also Shoemaker-Levy 9, the comet that collided with Jupiter in, I think, 1994. Uh, a related population are the, the scattered Kuiper Belt objects, because you could think of them as a, a Neptune family of objects, and then the Earth and Mars encountering asteroids. We want to determine things like a typical temporary capture time of something like Oterma about Jupiter. Because for a while it was, in some sense, orbiting Jupiter. It was a, a temporary moon. We want to look at things like a transition probability between the exterior and interior regions, like what Oterma did. But also a probability of comet collision. So Oterma could have easily, it's, it's in a regime of motion where it could have easily hit Jupiter. And in fact, it eventually, I think, has to. Uh, and the same thing could be said for near-Earth asteroids regarding collision with the Earth. And if there's time, I'll, I'll talk about binary asteroids and ejecta escape and re recapture and some other issues that I think are in the future. So planetary ejecta transfer, star cluster mass loss, and what are the effects of, of drag and dissipative perturbations. So here are the scattered Kuiper Belt objects seen in an inertial frame. We can uh, straighten this out and make it a little bit easier when we look at uh, a plot of the objects in semi-major axis versus eccentricity. So each of these little uh, pluses is the location of a scattered Kuiper Belt object. I've also plotted some curves which correspond to the, the Tisserand parameter with respect to Neptune. And basically this is an approximation which tells us that anything on a curve is on a, a fixed energy shell of the restricted three-body problem, considering the Sun, Neptune, and then the, the object as the third body. So that means we should look at the restricted three-body problem. So think of, uh, maybe think of the Moon and the Earth as being along uh, this little x and little y axes. And we're, uh, we're, we want to un understand the motion of some much smaller body, P, moving in the field of these two massive bodies which may be moving on a circular orbit or an, or an eccentric orbit. Let's, let's assume at first that it's a circular orbit about their common center of mass. We want to look at this motion in that rotating frame, so not an, an inertial frame, a frame where the, the two bodies are fixed along the x-axis. Then the e equations of motion look like motion in an effective potential, shown here, which has several interesting features, plus a, a Coriolis force. And this is a, a very old problem. It goes back to uh, the work of Jacoby Hill even Lagrange. Euler. And Euler, yes. Yes, should not forget Euler. Um, the Hamiltonian function. So all, all of you remember Hamiltonian dynamics, hopefully. This is the Hamiltonian function for the two degree of freedom restricted, circular restricted, planar three-body problem. It's time independent when we go into a rotating frame. This is the, the form of that effective potential we saw on the previous slide. And the only parameter here, if we look in um, non-dimensionalized coordinates, is this parameter mu. This is the mass ratio of the smaller mass to the sum of, of the two masses. And in the solar system, typically this is very small. So one over a hundred, or one over a million, very small. When we look in, in this system, we want to break it up into uh, smaller dimensional pieces. So we, we start out with a four-dimensional phase space. We want to break that into these energy surfaces. Since we have a Hamiltonian system, motion um, for any given initial condition is going to be restricted to be at a constant energy surface. So in the two degree of freedom case, these are 3D surfaces in the 4D phase space. In the three degree of freedom, these are 5D energy surfaces. Now, it, uh, recent work suggests that there are regions of the en energy surface um, for, for bodies that are where the motion is nearly ergodic. So we would call this the chaotic sea. So we can, we can look in that chaotic sea 
And one way to, to do that, so we've got a 3D ener energy surface. We want to reduce the dimensionality even more so we can visualize it in, in 2D. We use this procedure of the Poincaré surface of section. So for some fixed energy, we can look at uh, slices of the phase space. So if we look at a, a piece of, of the phase space, uh, which is now just 2D, so we've fixed one of the coordinates and we're on an energy surface. Now the motion looks like a 2D map. So if we start out with, with point Z under the natural dynamics, we pierce this surface again at uh, this point P of Z. So the Poincaré surface of section, it's just a slice of the energy surface. And it, it tells us what's going on um, in a, a way that's easy to visualize instead of visualizing the full 3D space. So it's just 2D Poincaré map. So let's look at the, the Poincaré map down below here. This is in coordinates of a semi-major axis, and then I have a, an, an, another coordinate. Up above, I've shown a histogram of the, the phase space average and the time average for semi-major axis in the chaotic sea. And they're, they're pretty close to each other, suggesting that the motion is nearly ergodic. You can see where there are these major dips, that's actually where we have these KAM tori, or stable resonances, that the chaotic sea avoids. It goes around them. So this, this um, scattershot pattern, that's what I'm calling the, the chaotic sea. And where we have closed curves or just emptiness, those are uh, KM tori, or stable islands. So the, the chaotic sea has shores around these stable islands. We can look at a, a histogram of the, the chaotic sea uh, for the Jupiter family comets. So this is looking at the three-body problem, Jupiter, Sun, and the uh, comet. The histogram is shown in, in red, just from a simple three-body problem calculation. And the actual comet data for Jupiter family comets is shown barred. And you can see they, they match each other pretty well. There are these significant dips which correspond to resonances that the Jupiter family comets avoid. They actually avoid resonances because they're, they're moving between them in this chaotic sea. If we sum over energy layers, we'll get a, a fuller picture. So this theoretical curve was just for one energy, which is kind of the average for the Jupiter family comets, very close to Oterma's energy. And by energy, I mean that Hamiltonian energy, so the three-body energy. We can understand uh, the, the motion in this chaotic sea somewhat by looking at what happens around resonances. So for resonances, we've got fixed points, which are stable resonances. Um, we also have unstable points. So they, they, they come in in groups of stable and unstable resonances. If we look at the, the unstable resonances, these are fixed points of a 2D map, a 2D area preserving map. Look at the stable and unstable manifolds. So these are the trajectories which asymptotically approach and depart uh, that unstable resonance. We can uh, trace them out till they have their first intersections and we get something like this, this blue region here. And transport from one side of this resonance to another because there is a little bit of a chaotic sea going from one side to the other. Transport from one side to the other is determined by something called lobe dynamics. So these things that are colored in red and in green, these are, these are lobes. So let's just look at that a little bit further. Uh, the green lobes, these are lobes which are going to, on the next iteration of the Poincaré map, everything in this green lobe is going to be inside the, um, the resonance region colored in, in blue. So these are called entrances or en entrance lobes and similarly we have exit lobes in, in red these are all the trajectories which have just left this blue region so we have exits and entrances both on the top and the bottom of, of the resonance and if you just look at how these lobes move around and intersect one another that gives us an idea of how transport occurs and what it looks like uh, physically so we look at a Poincaré section on, on the left and just trace around what does uh, an initial condition do. It moves around resonances and makes these big jumps. What it looks like physically is scattering. So the picture, or schematic on, on the right, scattering of some particle due to uh, close approaches with the smaller mass. And we can look at, I'm going to show a movie here of what the what the phase space structure looks like at several different energies. 
So you can see there are these resonances, and as we change energy, the chaotic sea changes. In fact, in this case, the, the chaotic sea is, is growing, and the stable islands are mostly shrinking or moving. So scattering looks like movement through this chaotic sea, which up here in semi-major axis versus eccentricity, it looks like motion, somewhat chaotic motion, along one of these tisserand curves. So we can, we can establish that there are minor bodies that seem to exist in chaotic sets, which we can view as mixing regions of, of the phase space. And the motion's partly determined by this uh, method called the lobe dynamics. But what about uh, objects that encounter the smaller mass or collide with it? In that case, we have to look at something called tube dynamics. So we're going to look at that energy surface again. Look at its connectivity. So now imagine we're looking at the, the Earth and, and the Moon, and we've got a particle or a spacecraft that's just moving in the Earth-Moon system. That energy surface can be partitioned into three realms. So realm just meaning a large chunk of, of phase space. We've got the realm around the Earth. So that's the phase space around the Earth, phase space around the Moon. And then outside of them both is the exterior realm. So for a given energy, we have these nicely partitioned. So the, the gray region is something that for a, a given energy is not energetically available. So we can call it a, a no-fly zone. As we tune this energy, we can see that the connectivity of, of the realms changes. So for very low energies, the three realms are disconnected. As we increase in energy, they start connecting a little bit. Um, until we reach a high enough energy where there, there is no forbidden region anymore. So we, we want to focus on cases where uh, there's a little bit of a, a neck that's opened up between the three regions. So I, I call this in general the interior region, the capture region, and the exterior region. So the, the objects that play a role in transport from one realm to another are uh, orbits that exist around uh, points called L1 and L2. Those are where the necks seem to be centered on. These are unstable orbits. I mean, unstable points. They've got periodic and quasi-periodic orbits that go by various names. And they're invariant manifolds, or what play a key role. So this is an uh, invariant manifold of... We've got the stable in green and unstable manifold of a particular orbit about one of these Lagrange points. So you can go into orbit about one of these points even though there's no object you're orbiting about. It's just a, a dance of the three-body problem, a balance between the, the gravity of, of the two bodies. So these, these large realms are connected by tubes, and the tubes, I'll show them often as uh, strips. So I'm just projecting these tubes which live in, up in the phase space, on the right, I'll be projecting them down to the position space where they just look like strips. But if you're inside this, this strip and you want to be inside the tube, you have to have a particular velocity as well, even though I'm, I'm just showing position space. So these were uh, found locally by uh, mathematicians Conley and McGeehee in, in the 1960s, and they speculated on their use for uh, low energy transfers for spacecraft because there was a lot of excitement about going to the moon and finding fuel efficient ways to get to the moon. So they have this property, um, uh, the surface of the tube has the property that it's just made up of several trajectories. So if we look at the, let's look at uh, several in initial conditions that start on this line that goes through the Earth in the Sun-Earth system. Here's the point of balance in the Sun-Earth system, L2. There's also L1 on the opposite side, but this is L2. It's unstable. So here's an unstable orbit around L2. We can look at its stable manifold in yellow here, a trajectory along that tube will just wind onto that unstable periodic orbit. If we're inside the tube though, so inside of it, not on it, we'll, uh, the trajectory will look like this blue one. So it'll pass by L2 and then escape. If it's outside the tube, it'll come near L2 like this red trajectory and bounce back. So they have this separatrix property. They separate distinctly different kinds of motion. And even though we refer to them as, as tubes, they have a more exotic structure in the three degree of freedom problem. They're S3 cross R. 
So you call them hypertubes, but I don't want to get hyper. Um, so transport. These things determine transport between realms. So this is, this is distinctly different from the lobe dynamics, which occurs within one realm. This is what determines transport between realms. And they're, they're global objects, so even though we might just look at them locally, if we extend them out further, uh, numerically or some other way, they still have this property that anything that begins inside them will uh, eventually uh, travel near the equilibrium point and then get captured temporarily around the smaller body. So tube dynamics, in, in a nutshell, this is just that all motion between realms connected by bottlenecks in the phase space must occur through the interior of these tubes. They're pretty general. They're just a, a consequence of there being a rank one saddle in a Hamiltonian system. So that's a saddle across many centers. They're found in chemistry. Um, and they also they persist when we add an additional body. And also when the primary bodies, so those are the, the two massive bodies, when their orbit is eccentric, we still get these tubes. And I want to show a, a movie uh, by uh, Evan Golick that he did with some colleagues at Caltech. We're looking at, uh, think of this as a binary star system. So it's got a mass ratio of one, one tenth. So the body on the right is one tenth the mass of the sum of the two. We're starting out with trajectories along the left half. Um, of the x-axis. And this is all done in the eccentric or elliptic restricted three-body three problem. So we're looking at several uh, small particles and they'll be colored red if they don't get captured around the smaller body or blue if they do. So let me just let this movie go. And you can see that tube behavior persists even in this situation. So the blue particles do get captured around the smaller mass. So these tubes persist even in the presence of you know, a time-dependent perturbation. And they're observed in the solar system. Oterma is one example. And they, they even seem to be seen on galactic and atomic scales. And let me just mention those, those briefly. I, I mentioned you know, the formation of, of tidal tails or uh, stars leaking out of a star cluster. Uh, there's some recent work that seems to be um, using these tubes as a mechanism for generation of uh, either uh, leaking through bottlenecks, uh, stars leaking through bottlenecks in the star cluster, or the generation of spiral arm structure in galaxies. So this might be a, a, a fruitful approach. There's also atomic scale tubes. Like I said, these are ubiquitous in chemistry and atomic physics, at least when we, we can make a classical approximation. So for, for example, if we have a, a Rydberg atom and we have an electron moving in the uh, crossed electric and mag magnetic fields, we get a, a unstable uh, periodic uh, orbit surrounding an unstable point. And we can look at tubes which are incoming or out outgoing around the nucleus. And we can understand um, the chaotic scattering or, or time profile of capture of, of an electron using these tubes. Because the mathematics is all the same as long as we can make that classical approximation. So tube dynamics, how do we, how do we understand it? Well, we can, we can look at where tubes intersect Poincaré sections. Those, those are these, uh, the, these slices of the energy surface I, I talked about before. We usually have to look at more than one. So we'll have one Poincaré section per realm, for instance. And then we'll look at how tubes intersect, and we can understand things about transport and temporary capture around moons, and things like that. In particular, we can come up with a, a theorem of, of global orbit structure, where let's say we're talking about a, a particle in the Earth-Moon system. If we label the Earth, the Moon, and the exterior realms with E, M, and X, you can give me any string of, of letters M, X, and E, where they denote the different realms, and there is a trajectory whose itinerary matches that sequence. So this comes from a symbolic dynamics, dynamical systems theory. And it's, uh, it's a, a nice proof that gives us information about infinite itineraries 
but uh, for real world applications, we only care about finite itineraries. So we can label regions of common orbits using this itinerary idea by looking at intersections of tubes. You can think of this as tube hopping. We can do it for just one three-body system or, or multiple three-body systems. So let's uh, think of what Oterma did, at least the first part of its journey. It went from the exterior realm through the Jupiter realm and then to the Sun realm. So we'll call those X, J, and S. So let's try to find that itinerary. So we're looking for an initial condition with this itinerary. We'll try to do it first in the, the two degree of freedom system and then the three degree of freedom system. So this uh, somewhat complex picture on, on the left, this shows the, uh, this is for the, the energy that Oterma had. There's bottlenecks around uh, both of the uh, Lagrange points, L1 and L2, on either side of Jupiter. The green and the red uh, strips represent the stable and unstable manifolds of, of periodic orbits. So we have a zoomed in picture on, on the right. And you can see that these intersect in complicated ways. We look at their intersections on surfaces of section. So these surfaces of section that we label U1, U2, U3, and U4. So if we want to find something that goes from the exterior region to the uh, Sun region and passes through the, the Jupiter region, there's a particular uh, surface of section which is the natural choice for that. It's where these, these tubes um, in the Jupiter realm in intersect. So they're labeled TX bracket J. That means it's currently in the Jupiter realm and it came from the X realm. And similarly, this tube came from, no, it's, it's in the Jupiter realm now and it's going to the S realm. So if we look at a Poincaré section, so this is down on the bottom, this is just a projection onto position space. If we look up in the Poincaré section, here's what those, the slices of those tubes look like. And you can see there's a little bit of overlap here. We have a natural way to label these, we might call them tiles of the phase space, or tiles of the Poincaré section. This is XJ and JS. Just zooming in, we can label the, the intersection region as XJS. So that means currently in the Jupiter region, came from X going to S. If we take an initial condition in that, that region and numerically integrate it forward and backward, we get the desired uh, itinerary, so XJS it works pretty well. If we want to look at longer itineraries, so this just had three letters. If we look at longer itineraries, uh, the region of phase space gets significantly smaller. So if we just add two more letters to either side, J, um, now we get something that's much smaller. And if you imagine we continue this out infinitely, we're just going to get a point or a cloud of points. And that's where the theorem works. But the way that the theorem was, was constructed gives us these nice open sets of phase space, which we care about. So this is that trajectory. Uh, it's, it's a similar trajectory. It does what, uh, approximately what Oterma does. So XJ, SJ, X over the 70 years where we looked at this orbit from 1910 to 1980. Uh, this particular in initial condition has more windings around Jupiter, but we have the essential behavior down here in these letters. So we could do something similar in the three degree of freedom system, but now our Poincaré section is 4D instead of 2D, and I have a hard time drawing that, so I have to look at projections onto two canonical planes. So I can look at this object in 4D, look at the, the, the projection these two different planes. If I find an intersection in one of them, then I can uh, look at uh, what that corresponds to, the set of curves in the other projection, and we can find an initial conditions this way. So basically, we're still reducing things down to a 2D Poincaré section. We're just looking at a, a 2D parameter set of 2D Poincaré sections. So now we can get the same behavior, but in 3D, so you can see there's a X, Y, and Z component now. And you might wonder, well, what if you look at the, the surface of these tubes? Because I've been talking about the interior of, of the tubes, but if we talk about the surface of, of the tubes, then these are connecting orbits. 
So these, these connect orbits around each of the um, Lagrange points, so from L1 to L2 or vice versa. So this is one of these exotic heteroclinic connections. Uh, going from a quasi-periodic orbit around, say, L1 to a quasi-periodic orbit around L2. All right. Now, I, I, want to, I want to compute some interesting things with these tubes. I know that I can find itineraries, and that's, that's useful for uh, cataloging and cata characterizing uh, comet trajectories. It's also useful for finding spacecraft trajectories, which can do interesting things using very little fuel. What if I want to compute things like escape and capture rates? So let, let's imagine that an asteroid or something hits Mars, kicks up a lot of ejecta, which is now has enough energy where it can escape the orbit of, orbit of Mars. We're going to model this as the restricted three-body problem. And we want to compute uh, how quickly do objects escape the orb orbit of Mars and go sunward. So this is a escape rate problem. We're going to use a statistical approach used in chemistry called transition state theory to estimate this escape rate. So basically, we look at the chaotic sea um, in the Mars realm, looking at a, a Poincaré section at a fixed energy, and look at the ratio of the size of the exit to the size of that chaotic sea. So we're going to be making a, a mixing assumption, which is common in chemistry and seems to work there. And we want to know if it works in celestial mechanics as well, which is that all asteroids in the chaotic sea surrounding Mars are equally likely to escape to the sun realm. So this is what it, it looks like numerically. The black is the chaotic sea. Blue are two uh, resonant islands that we're going to ignore, because anything there won't escape. And the red is the, the exit. So this is where the tube, which is going to go sunward, uh, pierces the chaotic sea. The first time it, 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 it pierces it. We're going to get an escape rate constant, which is related to the, the area of just this little red exit to the chaotic sea. So this gives us a, an exponential rate of uh, decay. So for, if we look at the survival probability for a piece of ejecta, how long does it take to escape? We'll look at that survival probability as a function of periods of Mars around uh, the Sun. And that gives us the, the, the dashed line. So making the approximation I said before, I mean solid line, we get the solid line. That's the theory. If we compare this with a Monte Carlo simulation of looking at 100,000 um, little bits of uh, ejecta and count how many of them survive at each moment in time. After a little transient, we get these, uh, we get it uh, matching pretty closely to the theory. This was work done uh, in collabor collaboration with some chemists who said uh, this is actually a better fit than we see in most chemistry problems. So it means that the mixing assumption is a better approximation uh, for celestial mechanics, which was surprising. Now, similarly, we can look at the, the rate of capture for an asteroid in this realm around the sun. Um, if it has enough energy that it could pass through this bottleneck around one of these Lagrange points, L1 in this case, we can look at the probability of it actually encountering Mars or getting captured around Mars temporarily. It's a similar procedure. Now it's just area of the exit Marsward. And it's, it's the same area because the tube is the same. The tube diameter is the same. But now the area of the interior chaotic sea is much bigger. There's a lot more room around the sun than there is around Mars. So here's the chaotic sea around uh, uh, the sun. Uh, the white holes, these are um, stable islands, KAM tori, that we ignore. So we just count the, the black region here. And we can look at uh, the probability of Mars capture for a heliocentric asteroid that has this energy. And we can estimate a half-life until capture of about uh, 10 to the 5 years. This is probably an overestimate because we're ignoring partial barriers due to that, but related to the lobe dynamics I mentioned earlier. And this doesn't tell us anything about what happens once the asteroid is captured around uh, Mars. It's temporary, but it could also uh, collide. So we want to explore that um, by looking at uh, two Poincaré sections, so one related to an incoming 
Think of it as a beam of asteroids coming in and then an outgoing uh, Poincaré section. So this is very much related to a problem that's already been worked on already, which is this, uh, the Rydberg ion in crossed magnetic and electric fields, where you want to track the motion of the electron. So the capture time profile is not exponential in this case. It's, it's very structured because of this, this tube dynamics. So we're, we'll look on, uh, instead of looking at those two Poincaré sections I, I mentioned before, we'll just look at one Poincaré section where we know that an incoming tube and an outgoing tube intersect. So the mechanism of scattering, in this case, we can think of it as it's the intersection of incoming and out, outgoing tubes. So even though I show this incoming tube uh, piercing the surface once, it actually uh, continues uh, several more times. It just gets um, harder to draw. It's easier to draw on a Poincaré section, but it starts winding and breaking. So we can look at the, the entrance. This is the first intersection of the incoming tube. That's in green. And then the exit is the last intersection of the outgoing tube. So anything in green is going to uh, leave the system. So we just look at intersections of images of the ent entrance with the exit, and this determines the capture uh, time profile. So you could think of it as it's a fractal tiling of this exit. So A1, this corresponds to objects which only circuit around uh, Mars once, and A2 is uh, objects that circle twice, A3, three times, and so on. I showed that in the two degree of freedom problem where we had a 2D Poincaré section, but we could also do that for a 4D Poincaré section and compute intersection volumes using a Monte Carlo approach because we have a good idea of where these tubes intersect um, so we can put bounding boxes around them and then just use Monte Carlo to count the, the fractional volume of uh, intersection. So the capture time profiles, this is uh, say loops around Mars as a function of time, and we get, we get something that's very structured. So there's a lot of particles that don't only circle once and twice and three times, it goes down. And then we have a lot of things again that go around five times, six times. So it's not exponential, not by any stretch. And if we look at different energies, we still see something that's not exponential. It's pretty structured. But that doesn't give the full picture. The full picture is more complicated because we can get effects like uh, transition from one realm to another. So instead of going through one neck and coming out that same neck, we might go through one neck and leave through the other. Or we might collide, like the red trajectory here, which Shoemaker-Levy 9 did, collide with Jupiter. Um, Oterma, however, at least over the time that we looked at it, transitioned from one realm to another. So in that case, we would want to look at uh, the intersection of tubes in, this, in the Jupiter realm. Now, if Oterma really did go from the outside to the inside, the exterior to the interior, it has to be in the intersection of the tubes. That was the in intersection I showed earlier. But now we have uh, an interpretation of this, uh, this intersecting area. If we look at the, the ratio of this area of intersection, to the area of the orbits coming from the exterior, that gives us a, a relative probability for Oterma to pass from the outside to the inside, given that it's, it came from the outside of Jupiter. So if we just plot that transition probability as a function of three-body energy for objects uh, coming from L1, or coming from the L2 direction, so that means going from the X to the S or S to the X, they're almost on top of each other. There's an energy below which we wouldn't expect any transition at all. And uh, Oterma, um, I've drawn its energy, and it seems to be in the region of about 25% probability. So this means we're, we're on to something. If Oterma was actually down here where we didn't expect anything, um, that would be bad. So we could also look at how this, this tube, because this tube is uh, the it, it's the region where everything that's going to get captured around Jupiter must pass through. We could look at how that tube intersects Jupiter itself. So now not looking at transitions from one realm to another, but looking at intersections with, with Jupiter. We just uh, 
take into account the diameter of, of the planet and look at where a tube, so now looking on a, on a Poincaré section still, look at what portion of that tube intersects the planet. That's the portion shown in, in black here. So in black we've got collision, red, non-collision. So we could look at probability of collision coming from uh, the, the two bottlenecks around L, L1 or L2, and we'll see that they seem to peak around the region where we think Shoemaker-Levy uh, 9's energy was. Its energy isn't very constrained. Um, because it's one of the most chaotic objects that we've discovered. But it's, at least the, the range that we believe it was in, uh, seems to overlap this region of high probability for collision. And you might be wondering, well, can we do the same calculation for near-Earth asteroids? And yeah, of course, we can do that. And we see that there's an energy below which we wouldn't expect any collisions at all. And then it uh, rises steeply and then seems to level off. And this is uh, interesting because we can, we can find out you know, which energies have highest probability of collision for objects coming from this L1 direction. The L1 direction is in the direction of the sun. So Earth-based telescopes have a hard time finding or detecting these objects so we can think of them as more dangerous. And yet here's a, a typical Earth collision. You wouldn't have much warning. Uh, the time scale here is maybe a, a, few, a few weeks. So you might not find this in time. We can look at a simple probability model for Earth collision, just inspired by uh, chemical reaction kinetic mechanisms. Come up with a collision probability. And if we uh, plug in the, the energy for a, a known potentially hazardous asteroid, 2004 MN4, we come up with a, a time to collision of 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 years. How did these objects get there to begin with? I don't, I don't know, because this is much smaller than the age of the solar system. These things must be bouncing around. Uh, let me just uh, go briefly into some other topics and where you could apply these, these tube dynamics. Uh, what about binary asteroids? So here's a picture that uh, was taken during the Galileo mission of NASA. We've got uh, Dactyl, this much a uh, smaller object in orbit around Ida, Ida, which is a large potato-shaped asteroid, which is rotating. So we can do something similar in this case because there are these unstable periodic orbits, rank one saddles. Uh, here's a, the surface of an idealized elliptical astro uh, asteroid, which is rotating. We could look at collisions and also look at a mechanism for ejection. And we can see, if we look on the uh, a Poincaré section, we see that these alternate fates of ejection and collision for a small companion to a large rotating asteroid are intermingled in the phase space. If we add uh, bouncing, then we get a simulation like I show on, on the right. So this is a small companion hitting a rotating asteroid, where we, we take into account um, the football shape by including a 1 over r cubed term in the potential. So this thing bounces a few times, but eventually it gets hit so hard that it, it escapes. I don't know if these companions are bouncing, but it's nice for visualization. What are some other situations? We could look at uh, star cluster mass loss. In fact, others are, are doing that. Ejected transfer between planets. Uh, so for example, if we've got a central star and two, two planets, or think of this as a central planet and two moons, we could look at where uh, tubes coming from one moon intersect tubes going to an, another moon. Look on the Poincaré section, and that uh, the intersection of the tubes is the the fraction that's transported from one moon to another. So this might be a way that material gets transported in the solar system. Um, this is a, an actual comet, which seems to do some transition from being under the control of Jupiter to being under the control of Saturn. So it's not unheard of that things can make these, these large transfers from one place to another, except in this case it's a comet, so it's a pretty large object, not a small dust-sized particle. If we do consider dust, then we probably need to take into account other effects. 
uh, dissipative effects. So that now, if we look in a rotating frame, um, a distribution of, of dust particles is going to be uh, at different energies. So if, even if they all started out at the same three-body energy, they're going to move between ener energies. Uh, this is semi-major axis versus eccentricity. And in, in this case, when we include dissipation, uh, particles seem to uh, collect in, in resonances. So they kind of spiral in and get stuck in resonances rather than stay in the chaotic sea. So it depends on the, the time scale of the dissipation effects to um, non-dissipative effects. So let me give some final words. There really is an interplanetary transport network. Hopefully I've convinced you of that. And there is this a relationship between phase-based geometry and statistics for low dimensional systems. And uh, I think celestial mechanics is just one example, but there are, there are others from chemistry and other Hamiltonian systems. There's connected chaotic sets and the transport in those connected chaotic sets occurs by uh, different mechanisms like lobe dynamics and tube dynamics. And it's related to phenomena like ejection and, and collision. And statistical ideas from chemistry may, may be useful even in uh, astronomy, which I, I think has been appreciated quite a bit over the past several years. Uh, it may be that one needs to look at coarse variables if you have a very large dimensional system, if you could reduce things down to few dimensions. Uh, this, so this relates to what I think might be the, the limitation of this approach. It might be limited to just a few dimensions right now, like 4D and 6D, until we can start computing phase volumes in arbitrary dimension. So you might want to go down to coarse variables. So look at a low dimensional manifold that dominates the dynamics and do some calculations there. Uh, this, is, this is work uh, done by a large group of people that I wanted to acknowledge, in particular Wang Sang Kuhn, uh, Martin Lowe, Jerry Marsden at, uh, at Caltech and JPL, uh, Dan Shears, who's now at uh, Colorado, and uh, Piyush Grover, who's working with me at Virginia Tech, uh, but also many, many others uh, who provided uh, inspiration um, and uh, collaboration. Um, if you want any of the papers or movies, you can get them from a website. Plus, there's, there's a book available for free. Download it for free from this website. It goes more into the space mission design aspects, but also covers uh, some of the issues I, I talked about today, like tube dynamics and lobe, lobe dynamics. And hey, it's free. So I thank you for your time, and I'll, I'll take questions. It's amazing to me that the three-body problem is still an active area of research and we're still learning so much from the restricted three-body problem. Yes. <clears throat> and I should have mentioned that what I call the Lagrange points should really be called the Euler Lagrange points because Euler found them first. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and we use that terminology in the book. So. He didn't find all of the Lagrange points. He found the, the, the collinear ones, which are the ones we care about because they dominate transport. Well, the, the, you'd have to look at the, the energy of the object that you're, that you're considering. So uh, there are many objects, these potentially hazardous asteroids, which have energies such that they can go through these bottlenecks at L, L1 or L2. So Earth is not protected, uh, but it, it's unknown where these near-Earth asteroids came from or why they're, they're still around. I mean, maybe they, we started out with a, a large reservoir of them and they've been colliding with the Earth. Uh, over, over time, uh, but there, there are thousands of these objects and they're discovering more every day, I mean, at least with respect to the Earth. Um, and a significant fraction of, of those can be significantly affected by this tube dynamics. And so those that are in the direction of, of the Sun, so in the interior region with respect to the Earth, I think those pose a, a large threat 
And, but we have the capability now to determine where those objects may be. So if we say, which objects can hit us within five years, 10 years, 100 years, we have a way of, of, of mapping out where those objects could be. So we can get some, um, know where to aim our telescopes. If you have a rank one saddle, or I mean, if it's, a, if it's a Hamiltonian system and you've got an interesting unstable point, then uh, I, think, I think the ideas could apply. So. Arnold diffusion is much slower than the time scale of this, this transport. I mean, as you saw from Oterma, that's something that happens over the scale of, of years. Just years, not millions of years. Um, transport through that, that bottleneck is very rapid on a celestial time scale. So it's, it's um, I mean, what we're finding are co-dimension one objects. So that's important because with KM tori, they're not large enough to bound any piece of, of, of phase space. But these tubes connected to unstable points are large enough to bound regions of phase space so that they give a, an open set of the objects that go from one realm to, an, to another. Um, how it relates to Arnold diffusion, I'm not, I'm not clear. I just know, I know that this is very rapid and Arnold diffusion is very slow. Well, these, these tubes, um, I, I usually only show just one intersection of them with the Poincaré section, but if you look at, if you follow them further and further in time, they, they break up and wind, and they, they tend to wind around KM tori. Um, but there's an, there's an equal flux coming in as there is going out. It, it, it may be related to weak chaos, um, but it's, it's, un, it's unclear right now. I mean, especially in, I mean, in the three degree of freedom case, I'm not sure, because then we're talking about a, these, these tubes are really solid 5D objects within the 5D energy surface, and how they wind around uh, the KM tori is unclear. I have a question. If I wanted to send my graduate student to every planet in the solar system, do you have a trajectory for me that would cost me the least amount of money? Uh, starting from where? It depends on where you start. Because uh, Martin Lowe at uh, JPL with a, a student looked at a trajectory that goes from being a Kuiper belt to a Jupiter family comet. If you had a way of picking the right initial condition in both sets, could you find something that patches the two? Uh, starting from the Earth, uh, yes. If you, have, if you have a large enough amount of time. So if you use... If you can just barely escape the, the, the Earth um, and you go in the Mars direction, you can find an, an initial condition which will go from an orbit around the Earth to the orbit around Mars, but it'll take millions of years to kind of go between resonances and, and so on. Uh, so if you have plenty of time, you can visit all the planets. And I mean, right now that's a, that's a conjecture, but I, I think it's, it's borne out by the numerical investigation so far. No. So I, I think you can go from an orbit. You, you won't be able to, to choose the orbit, but some orbit, a temporarily captured orbit around any planet or, or moon, and get to uh, another orbit around any other planet or, or moon. It may take an arbitrary large amount of time, but there's some natural path that connects the two. Other questions from the audience? If not, 
I'd like to thank you all very much for coming to Colloquia this week. And let's thank Shane for a very interesting talk.